So in our first session, we're focusing on project teams and questions central to project leadership. My name is Julianne Pollack, and we're looking at the question of project leadership, which increasingly incurs in the context of increasing risks, requiring adaptability to change, especially as projects grow in duration and complexity. With a focus on the emerging demands that are placed on project leaders and teams, we explore the ways that our existing narrative of project, project leadership and cultures of team management need to grow to meet capability and life cycle constraints. Now, I'm very fortunate to be joined by three great speakers to discuss these issues. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing Sonia Campbell, uh, who is Deputy Director of Commercial for New South Wales Treasury, previously Director of Capital Projects at PwC. I'm also joined by Professor Stuart Clegg, uh, who is with us at the University of Sydney, who has made a major contribution to power and paradox in the context of organisational theorising and project management research. And I think we should also have Professor Jeff Pinto from Penn State with us. Uh, but it looks like Jeff is having some connection uh, difficulties, which hopefully we can get past in the near future. When Jeff does, does join us, he's program chair of the MPM program at Penn State and holds the Andrew Morris and Elizabeth Lee Black chair in management technology. So, I'd like to start the conversation by um, asking a question to you, Sonia. What are some of the major leadership challenges that you're seeing in your work at the moment? Mm. Uh, good morning, Julian, and thank you for the very kind introduction and the invitation to participate in the discussion this morning. Um, I guess my first observation uh, from where I sit in Treasury with a very large portfolio of projects um, is that there's just been increasing complexity and scale of the projects that um, we're seeking to deliver, particularly over the last five to 10 years. And there hasn't necessarily been the same investment in the capacity and capability of the leaders who have both those project management and people management skills to be able to deliver those projects. And it's in that context that there is really that increasing need to acknowledge that different leadership styles are needed at different phases of projects. If you think about the project life cycle, they often have very long durations. Um, and in the world of government, you know, there's a strong need uh, at the very beginning <clears throat> to demonstrate that there is a need and the benefits and the outcomes um, from that investment um, and making the business case all the way through then to engaging with the market, um, shaping those projects, um, and then being able to deliver on those outcomes and benefits in a way that is accountable and responsible. Um, and I think the biggest challenge for leaders at the moment is how do we establish those project teams and the necessary leadership skills required to balance all of the competing interests that will change over time in an increasingly dynamic and complex environment, knowing that um, we will never know all of the project risks at the time that we, you know, embark uh, on, on defining the project and establishing those relationships, um, you know, with the necessary, uh, you know, partners to be able to deliver those benefits. And one of the things I've, I've observed <clears throat> over my time, um, you know, I've worked for very large contractors, um, you know, I've worked on the client side, I've worked uh, on the consulting side, um, is that there is a need for that different leadership and, a, and not necessarily a focus on project continuity and communication of, you know, those outcomes that we set out to achieve at the beginning. Um, and often that is lost through scope creep, et cetera. Um, but, but how do we properly transition from that project development phase through to the project delivery phase? And what are the skills of our, our people that we need? Um, and so I think there needs to be a real focus on that. Um, you know, it's a 
dynamic and complex world in in delivering um, major projects. And in in my portfolio, that spans everything from infrastructure to whole of government procurement to banking reforms, um, you know, major asset sales. So um, the, the, there is a big people ask. And, and I think that um, we need to continue to focus on how we create that culture um, and, and understanding and communication that's needed to successfully deliver these projects. Sonia, you mentioned uh, that there's different skills and capabilities required in not just um, team formation, but also leadership as we move across different uh, project phases. Could you expand on that a little? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I'm often saying that um, you've got a lot of people who like to come in and do the deals and it creates a lot of complexity and then you bring in a new team to actually deliver on you know the deal that was done so to speak um, without the necessary transition and as our contractual requirements get very complex um, it's incredibly difficult to actually understand what your rights and obligations are as you navigate through that project delivery phase and so I've always been very focused um, in my different roles in making sure that there is that communication and being able to translate that complexity to people to understand what their role is and then that's you know the need for the project leader to create that culture um, you know think about the project as an enterprise or an organization you know that that has um, you know outcomes that need to be delivered how do you define that for people all across the projects and when you're talking about projects some of these mega infrastructure projects that are worth billions of dollars, you know, we see payment claims coming through that are like $100 million a month. So how do you actually assess that scope and ensure the quality of the work? Um, it's an incredibly complex um, and demanding role that we're expecting of our leaders. And, and I'm often saying as a leader, um, I don't have all the answers and I can't do it myself. So it's about having and building a team around me and empowering them, you know, to be able to mm. go and deliver, um, you know, on on a very clear set of objectives that, that have been established um, uh, from the duration of the project. Um, and, and there's the complexity of the stakeholder environment as well, Julian. Um, you know, in, in the world of government, you know, we're increasingly doing, um, you know, precinct style work where you've got you know community and and a lot of competing and different interests um it's it's a really big job in itself to manage that type of stakeholder engagement um and and the the, the real challenge at the moment is we've got a very hot labor market here i think as everybody knows a lot of competition for the best resources um with, with a lot of investment that's happened um particularly stimulus, additional stimulus that went into the economy through COVID, um, how do we make sure we're doing the right projects for the right reasons and that we've got the, the people and the support that they need? Um, and that goes to systems as well and technology, you know, which is something that um, I think in the Australian market, um, you know, we've still got a lot of room to improve in terms of how we harness, you know, the capability that's there to improve project outcomes. So this idea of deliberately um, using different people to lead and manage different project phases is a very interesting one and potentially something uh, which I imagine could help address some of the resource constraints um, mm -hmm. that we might sometimes be facing. Uh, but Stuart, if I could ask you to extend on this, um, the opportunity to deliberately hire people for different project phases may address some individual capability issues but what else does it apply in terms of, uh, imply in terms of handover sure i mean th this is a an approach that's often used with uh, lots of complex projects um it doesn't always work as well as it should because every time you have a change of pro project leader you have a handover pro pro, pro mm -hmm. problem and and handoffs can be very very problematic um Carl Weick, who has done a lot of research in uh, in this area, looked at uh, disasters at airports, looked at uh, uh, hospitals and uh, uh, 
clinical errors that have occurred in hospitals. These often occur as a result of handoffs, uh, handovers, as we would say in, 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 uh, in Australia. So I think you might be solving some problems with that solution, but I think you could be creating new ones. Um, now, the alternative is that you have to have some kind of polymath who is a project leader who can lead through everything with skills and capabilities capable of um, um, full, the full range from sort of digital through to construction, through to the politics with, the, with government and community relations. Well, we're not going to find those polymaths very easily. So we, we will have the handover issues, the handover problems. So that probably means uh, a, a lot of scoping and a lot of collaboration through the process. So that rather than seeing these as discrete phases and discrete chunks, they need to be overlapped, there needs to be collaboration, and there needs to be coactive uh, relations, collaborative power relations between the different parties as they, uh, as they forward the project, as they, they, they progress the project. That's really interesting, this idea of overlapping different parade um, uh, phases and the uh, making a smoother handover between different groups. Yeah. Um, Jeff, it's great to see that you've managed to join us and overcome technical difficulties in a virtual environment. It ha has happened to all of us at one stage or another, um, but I'm glad you got, got here in time. I understand you've also done some research into the need to replace project managers during delivery. That's correct, Julian. Um, I was I was intrigued to hear what Stuart had to say precisely on this account because it does mirror uh, pretty closely our findings. Um, I, I agree with him. I believe he's completely correct that the process of handoffs or handovers can be fraught with a whole lot of difficulties. What, when we did our study, when I say we, I'm referring to Francesco Di Maldoloni and Kate Davis in the UK and myself, we were looking at instances where it was determined that it was necessary to replace a project manager mid-project while it was ongoing, and what were oftentimes the reasons why that might occur. Um, among the reasons we found were, first of all, the obvious ones, um, sort of an abject failure if the person was attempting to run the project and was not meeting their, their gates. So they were using some sort of stage gate process and they simply were not um, keeping up with it. So the project was showing a steady series of underperformances in, in schedule and time. Alternatively, what we found was that in many cases, these handovers are planned. They're done on purpose. Uh, I completely agree with Stuart's point. The polymath, the, the Sir John Arnott, for example, in the UK, who's done such marvelous work with the London Olympics and then was working on, uh, on rail and on some of their energy projects. Yes, those folks uh, are specifically people that come to mind precisely because they are so rare. And so Rather than, than staking our, our hopes on the unicorn that can take us from the beginning of the process to the end, what we found in our study was that many times project replacement is not a black mark against the project manager. In fact, it is done purposefully because they recognize that this, the skill set necessary to run the front end, perhaps to get all the ducks in a row, is not the one that will allow them to deal with the technical challenges downstream. And so, or again, to Stuart's point, that the problem may be one of integration, that you may have um, a project manager, Simon Wright for um, London Crossrail, who did a great job with getting all the pieces done, but failed with the integration aspect of it. And because of that, they had to replace him at, at a point in 2018 because the project was lagging as a result. So absolutely, I think there are times when it's necessary to make that change. Sometimes it's forced upon an organization. Surprisingly, many times it's planned, it's built in. But again, Stuart is correct also that the nature of the stages are much more dynamic and they're much more um, fluid 
They don't have sharp points and saying, okay, here's when it has to be done. These things are oftentimes are emergent. Now, Jeff, I imagine that uh, as we culturally move from a position of expecting someone to be the unicorn polymath, heroic project manager who carries something throughout all phases, uh, we might encounter some cultural issues. Um, we might find some resistance to this idea. Would that be correct? I think there's, it is correct, but it's correct to the degree that we prepare the soil in advance. I think the, the happenstance of replacing a project manager can be, I, I hate to use the word cataclysmic because that, I don't mean to be over, you know, to over egg it. But there are times when we have to replace. And at the, that point, many times the project is in such a deep hole that the culture, if you will, of the project as it has been moving along is, is so poor that the first thing that we found in our research that a new project manager has to come in and do is affirm the basic commitments, affirm the basic goals and the, the plans of what the project is about. But within the context of making those basic affirmations, also taking a, a sickle to some of the other behaviors that are taking place, not, not simply the project activities, but even the underlying cultural issues that are starting to emerge there as well. And so that makes it doubly difficult for these emergent project managers or these replacement project managers to make their mark because they have to do it moving against the flow of cultural mores at that point in time, which many times have become very damaging. And I know I've done work again with Kate Davis looking at normalization of deviance and the whole idea of, if you will, a sick organizational culture many times is manifested by the fact that they've allowed deviant behaviors to continue on unchecked. And that many times is a symptom of a much deeper project, uh, um, cultural project problem that's existing. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Um, Sonia, if I could ask you to potentially extend on this. Mm. In your experience, how are our behavioral expectations for project leaders and the teams they, they work with changing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've had a project culture, at least here in Australia, for some time that is is wide has been widely regarded as you know quite um, antagonistic, and I think that has come from behaviours that um, you know both on the client and the contractor side are there to sort of you know protect budgets and you know have to finish the project on time, and have become quite contractual. And I think the shift now is an expectation in the behaviour of those leaders to be collaborative. And, and what does that mean? How do we define what collaboration is? And it's not something that you can necessarily put into words or put into a contract um, or easily be able to measure. And what it requires of leaders is, is a big time commitment. You know, it's, it's about consultation. It's about picking up the phone and building relationships and building trust so that you can come together to resolve problems without necessarily you know resorting um, to the contract or you know protecting your position and so how do we set up projects now um, to actually align behaviors and you know create that best for project mindset um, you know in the leaders on both sides or on all sides of the project because it applies down the supply chain as well um, and you know I think that takes a particular skill set to be able to do that. And that's not necessarily something that, you know, is in the textbook project management, you know, when you're looking at how you manage, you know, schedule and cost and resources, et cetera. It's, it's a combination of those skills. Um, and I often, you know, reflect on comments made by some of the very large uh, contractors that, you know, for these big projects, they're actually looking for like a CEO type skill set to be able to lead them, um, you know, which is, is is a very different approach to what we have seen in the past when projects were potentially, you know, better defined and in a less complex environment. So I think that's that's the behavioural shift is, is, you know, uh, understanding, you know, what collaboration looks like and building trust 
which is a necessary element to how you can manage risk, um, which is always going to arise on any project. That's that's really interesting. I think that you're really um, identifying something crucial here. Um, and Stuart, can I ask you to extend on this? You use the word coactive. Uh, when talking about a collaborative uh, relationship that project leaders and teams might have uh, in developing uh, the the project context. Could you expand on that, please? Uh, you're on mute, Stuart. Thanks for telling me. Yeah, the concept of uh, coactive uh, relations goes way back to uh, a founding mother of uh, management thinking. And um, I, um, I, I like the idea. I've seen it in practice. Um, I've seen it in practice in, uh, in project leadership uh, where various disciplines in the project team become champions for objectives which are outside of their normal disciplinary sphere of competence. So they learn to stand in the shoes of the others. They learn to, they learn to stand in the role and through being in the role, they begin to gain more sympathy and synergy with some of the problems and issues that the team experiences. So instead of the team seeing, oh, this person's just going on about their thing, Everybody gets a chance or the, the, the leadership team get a chance to change roles, to exchange roles and to begin to see the project in a more holistic way. And I think this, this worked remarkably effectively in the instances in, in which I've seen it. Um, coactive relations need to be not only team based within the leadership team. We also need to think on, on a broader palette, um, you know, the kind of major infrastructure projects which are occurring right now in, 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 in this city, Sydney, and I'm sure in other cities around the world, often are very, very intrusive and, and, and threatening. Their, 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 their meaning is scary for the people who live in or proximate to the communities in which these, uh, these things are, are occurring. We need to be able to see the whole job of project leadership as being able to communicate meaningfully socially to those people. I and mean, the role of social media is, is particularly important in this area. I've done some work with my colleague, Johan Neenan, uh, on uh, metro developments in uh, Chennai in India. And we've looked at the role of social media there to try and uh, media manage some of the uh, resistance and uh, dissensus that can occur in communities. It will happen anyway, even if you try to manage it. But you know, we have to get away from the idea of a kind of crash through or crash mentality. We have to try and be more positive in listening to the objections that might be that might occur from a community simply because they're not technically based. They're not engineers. They're, they're not project managers. But sometimes they might have some good ideas and we need to take them on board. And we should have some forms of uh, structural relations within within projects which uh, uh, can listen to what gets to be said from the community. Rather than having a, an adversarial relationship, as, 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 as Sonia said, the relationships can get very adversarial on, uh, on this front, both within the team, between different, uh, different skills, different disciplines within the team, but also between the team and the, uh, the communities within which the infrastructure is, uh, is, being, is being built. So, Stuart, what does that mean for... Uh, the people in a project context needing to attend to meaning? Are we needing to become more effective in controlling the, the meaning which is put out, or is it more of a case of co-creating local meaning with our project stakeholders or a mix of both? Well, I think the first thing is realising that meaning is important. It's not something that you impose on a situation, and it isn't simply given by the... Um, uh, the the dictates of project management, the dictates of engineering, the dictates of law, or the dictates of of, of the contract. I mean, contracts are complex um, complex opportunities to try to minimise risk. Which, when risk occurs, because events happen, they always will happen. Then you have lawyers at ten paces, and yeah, it's great for barristers; it keeps them in Mercedes. But it's not necessarily great for projects. So, if we can actually build more 
understanding and meaningfulness into the ways in which project leadership teams manage, we might just you know, a few barristers may have a few less Barris, a few less Mercedes, and that's a, that's a pity for them. But it might be better for the projects. Um, now, what that entails, I think, is the realization that project management isn't just a tech, a technical discipline. It's not just a question of technique. Really, yeah, I would say this: I'm a sociologist, a social scientist. It demands some people skills and some acquaintance with some of the core disciplines of social science is is the way to at least uh get that across to future generations so we we need to have broad based uh curricula in uh, in education i think there are also interesting implications here for the need to be open to meaning generation rather than just trying to defend an established position. Jeff, uh, I know you've done some research on authenticity. Does this change in our expectations for project leaders imply a different level of authenticity that's required? It's it's an interesting question, Julian. The, the problem, I, I guess, and let me just shape this a bit the the problem the focus that we deal with is when you have embedded systems in place uh cultural systems uh expectations for cybernetic control for the way we manage the projects themselves the problem is that when we're coming into a situation that is underperforming so whether it's a project team whether it's a project organization whether there's we're talking at a micro level at a much larger level. The problem becomes one of how do we manifest um, legitimate change here? Now, that's that's a almost a naive question to ask, and I recognize that. And therefore, I think part of the response here can also strike people initially as naive. And yet part of the problem is that we, as particularly as scholars, we, we tend to look at these things many times from a much more um, complex perspective. And that's not to say that we don't have um, some, some logic behind why we do that. But yet, those of us who also work with projects, with project teams, and with project managers, we can harken back to some of the work that was done back in the, in the 90s, for example, when Eli Goldratt first came out with Critical Chain. Um, for some of us, we looked at critical chain, and I know people like uh, Bill Duncan and some other folks from PMI, they sort of said it's it's much ado about nothing. It, it doesn't really, ex or it's, it's all he's doing is wrapping up old wine in, in new bottles, but it's the same thing we know. I, I tend to disagree. I think that what he was getting at there, and at least for me, it was really phenomenally important, was recognizing that if we want to continue to fail the same old way we've been failing with projects, we should manage them the same old way we've been managing them. And so he started saying things that were at the time really rather fascinating. So he started looking behaviorally at why projects run late. And I, I just finished a paper that was, was published on this particular topic. And one of the things that he argued, and, and I echo this from my own experience, so this isn't just sort of scanning the journals, this is working with project managers, is that there is an embedded need for self-preservation out there. And that is all the way up and down the project ladder. So everybody working on a project, project managers themselves, managers of project managers, program level and even higher, we all have an embedded self-preservation motivation. And so what he was getting at was what we have to do here is we have to do, agree to mutually disarm, if I can put it that way. And that is, so here's one example, and I, I won't belabor all of his points, but his one example was every one of us is has a vested interest in maintaining as much personal slack as we possibly can maintain. So we do this by padding our estimates. How long will this take you to do, Jeff? Uh, 10 days. Well, it really only takes me five days, but I, I need that extra five days because that gives me some personal safety. Now, when you work that logic, that thought process up and down the corporate ladder, you can see that we create these projects with these grotesque 
timelines because everybody's factoring this in and everybody knows everybody else is doing it. And so they're working like crazy to find ways to pry some of this safety out of the system. The irony, the underlying irony is that none of this, whether it's factoring in safety or trying to get rid of safety, none of this is based on honest communication and honest dialogue. It's been, and that's what was Goldratt's point. We need to disarm. Now, one of the ways we disarm as a project manager, for example, whether you're talking about a mega project or you're talking about a much more finite project, but the first thing we have to do is recognize that we have these motivations. And so I, as the project manager, have to signal, and this is where the authenticity term comes in, I have to signal that I am going to accept a 50-50 likelihood of your estimate for how long it'll take. 50-50 means exactly that. You may hit it, you may miss it, but at least you're giving me an honest assessment. Uh, Bob Graham, who I used to do some work with in consulting, he had a great expression about this. He said, if you don't take my time estimate seriously, I'm not going to give you serious time estimates. So what we have to do is start, and this is where authenticity applies, is we have to mutually disarm. We have, as project managers and as people working at that level, we have to start signaling to our folks that I'm going to back you. We're going to work on this process together, and we're going to jointly make this succeed. But you see, this becomes this embed that we're fighting against an embedded culture. And so the first thing we have to do is recognize that all the pressures in the organization are working against this happening because I want to protect myself and you want to protect yourself, et cetera. And so we have to stop doing that and we have to start working jointly. Now, I realize I'm giving a very brief peroration on a much, much more complex idea. And I recognize that in this time we have. But that's what it's coming down to, is recognizing the point that project managers and project team members have to start working jointly rather than at cross currents. Hmm. That, that's really interesting. It seems like we're coming increasingly to questions of empowerment, um, pro mm -hmm. providing a culture where teams can work effectively. Sonia, if I can pass to you at this point, how do we actually create uh, an environment where we can empower teams over time, whether that is creating a culture in an organization or one that persists through a long duration project as it moves through phases? That's a very difficult question, Julian, and I'm not sure I have a simple answer for it. Um, you know, I think it's <clears throat> it's it's more conversations like this, and it's definitely a recognition from the top down. You know, when I connect in with some of the Project 13, you know, thought leadership, um, it's it's all about, you know, that commitment from the very top of the board all the way through the senior leadership around how you're going to establish that culture and those relationships and take forward your projects. And I think without that commitment from the very top, it presents a lot of challenges, um, you know, to Jeff's point that, you know, people will be self-interested. Um, and so how you overcome that, I think, is, is certainly the biggest challenge we have for project leadership at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are almost to the end of this um, session, but I'd like to, we've had some excellent questions come up in the chat, and I'd like to look at one by uh, or from Ian Heppenstahl. If polymaths are so rare, might this be linked to the over-specialization of project skills? And if so, what can academia and business do to develop breadth of experience rather than depth? Stuart, I was wondering if you had a comment in response to this. And you're on mute. Thanks again for reminding me. Yes, um, the curriculum's mighty crowded. Uh, there are many, many things that we uh, we need to teach. We need to teach students. Um, I think. I think. Hands-on experience is really important. Um, the sooner we can have um, prospective project managers thinking about projects, designing ways in which they would accomplish projects, um, 
doing little mini projects. Uh, this, this gives them some grasp of reality. Otherwise, it's all textbook and, and, and article based. So we have, we have to try to give them concrete experience. I think this is uh, an extremely important thing to do. Um, I, as I said previously, I also think that it's important that uh, we don't over technicize the curriculum. Uh, we, uh, we, must, uh, we must draw on the insights of uh, the social sciences and uh, try to feed them into the, uh, the curriculum process because projects are not just a technical accomplishment, they're a social accomplishment. And uh, as a social accomplishment, it helps enormously if people have some, some understanding of, of how social realities get to be constructed, mm -hmm. uh, what the importance of meaning is, and uh, how relations between people typically unfold. This has been a really interesting conversation. So I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank Sonia Campbell, Stuart Clegg, Jeff Pinto for joining us. We've really come across questions of the need to develop a culture of trust, that one of the ways of developing this might be to not only starting small in some, um, some areas uh, where we can test things in a safe environment, but also to lead with the behaviours that we need to see. We've covered questions around the shifting dialogue from an egocentric uh, uh, heroic leader to questions of shared leadership, co-creation and multiple parties involved in the leadership process, both in terms of co-creation with stakeholders, but as we move from inception through delivery and into handover.